I'm extremely pleased to welcome Michael Webb back to Syracuse. As you all know, he's a prolific member of the 1960s collective Archigram, a radical group that Simon Sadler called the preeminent architectural avant-garde of its day. In 2002, Michael, with Archigram, was awarded the Royal Gold Medal, which is the highest architectural honor in Britain. But Michael was already a prodigious architectural talent even before joining Archigram in the early 60s. In fact, Sadler called his fourth year undergraduate project at the Regent Street Polytechnic in London probably the most notorious student project of the late 50s. It was subsequently selected by MoMA for the 1962 exhibition Visionary Architecture. His thesis project titled Sin Palace or Sin Center, which was failed repeatedly by the faculty at Regent Street, was recently exhibited and published alongside other early progressive projects by the likes of Eisenman, Venturi, Hadid, Kulhas, Rossi, Morphosis, and others at the Architectural Association in London in a show titled First Works, Emerging Architectural Experimentation of the 1960s and 70s. In addition to Sin Center, several of Michael's projects, including the Cushical, Pseudaloon, Rental Wall, and his ongoing drive-in house, some of which I hope he'll show us tonight, have become iconic projects of substantial disciplinary influence. Although he's often still considered part of the British architectural milieu, Michael has lived in the US for something close to 35 years, during which time he has lectured and exhibited widely and taught at a number of schools including Virginia Tech, NJIT, Columbia and Barnard, RISD, the University of Buffalo, and Princeton. And at the behest of Tony Vidler, he currently teaches first-year drawing at the Cooper Union. I first met Michael at a conference at UCLA in 2004. His drive-in house project provoked animated discussion. And by the end of the event, it was clear that his work resonated with the ambitions of architecture's nascent projective project. This shouldn't be too surprising given his past and recent work's attention to both performance and projection. For the exquisite multimedia drawings that were recently displayed in his Two Journeys exhibition at Cooper, Michael didn't invoke metaphysics, as many architects do, but instead a kind of hyperphysics, within which residual geometries and perspectival vanishing points conspire to produce precise effects. Most of these projects are not built in the conventional sense, but Michael still builds the drawing. He uses overlays of cropped lines, planes, numbers, and fields of color to situate viewers in exact positions and orientations. They intelligently distort architectural conventions in ways that can only emerge from an utter mastery of those conventions. The deans of several architecture schools were on hand for Michael's exhibition at Cooper, and I distinctly remember Mark Wigley publicly noting that Michael is the only architect about whom he had never heard anyone say a negative word. He's indeed an unfailingly generous architect and teacher, and clearly one of the great talents in the field. I'm proud to welcome him to the School of Architecture. Welcome, Michael. Yes. Sure. Can you hear now? Is it on? Typical Michael Webb, you know, sort of general technological chaos. And <laughs> as you see, nothing has changed. Is it on now? Yeah. Oh, it is. Oh, good. Um, now, I was last here just under three years ago and uh, was present at Tom Main's lecture, Morphosis Maestro Main. And it was very amusing because it went off like a normal lecture. And then after about an hour and a quarter in the auditorium, which was actually what in the warehouse building you said, not this one, um, 
suddenly there's a cell phone goes off. And everyone's looking around, you know, who forgot to turn their cell phone off? But it's Maine himself. Grabs, reaches in his pocket, pulls out the receiver. Hello? Oh, it's you, honey. I'm doing a lecture. And I just imagine the conversation between himself and honey beforehand. You, know, you call me at 6.15 and I'll know to end it. Um, but, but I mention this really not for the little bit of humour, but really for the fact that um, it's quite an easy lecture to give, Tom's lecture. It was a brilliant lecture, I thought. And, of course, his work is absolutely gorgeous. And I actually, at the moment, teach in a room designed by him down at Cooper Union. But um, you show your work, and then the spoken words become almost like uh, a series of verbal captions to the drawings. And I think the work I've done, the way I've spent my life, makes a lecture much more difficult to do. And I'll tell you why with the following anecdote. Um, imagine, if you will, I am at a cocktail party and a guy has engaged me in conversation and the inevitable question comes up and my answer is, oh, I'm an architect. But my voice and my appearance is filled with dread at this revelation <laughs> because I know what the follow-up question is going to be. <laughs> Here it comes. Oh, residential or commercial? <laughs> and, you know, I just don't know how to answer it. What do I say? And there's a nervous uneasy look on my face, and I can see that his eyes are swimming round the room, looking at who he can go and talk to, a nice, interesting person who's less obviously insane than this guy. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think the theme of my lecture tonight, as most of my lectures, is indeterminate, you see. Now, I want to start off, actually, with um, a beautiful dictum by David Green, one of our number. Um, and it's very rich and beautiful, I think. When it's raining in Oxford Street, now Oxford Street, of course, is one of the main shopping thoroughfares of London. When it's raining in Oxford Street, the rain is more important than the architecture. When it's raining in Oxford Street, the rain is more important than the architecture. So, therefore, should one be drawing the rain? And I think, then, perhaps, the answer to the question or the doubt I pose about the upcoming lecture tonight is maybe, hopefully, this is a drawing about the rain. But I want to start, actually, with... Um, um, the situation where the rain has stopped, the clouds have dissolved, and the sun shines o'er the Catskill Mountains in New York State. And as I have done for the last 17 summers, but no more, I'm sitting on the terrace of a very modern house, looking at this amazing view on a hot summer afternoon, and the sun is going down, and it will shortly set behind the mountains. And I'm sitting there nursing a martini. And I'm, I've come to the conclusion that actually what's happening is that the plane of the terrace upon which I'm sitting is tipping up. Rather gracefully and gently to begin with, but the angle keeps increasing. And as I have that second martini, <laughs> I'm noticing that not only is it tipping up, but it's tilting to the left. Think about it. The sun, of course, is actually fixed in the sky, and the plane of the Earth 
is tipping up to obscure it. And I say to myself, well, that would make rather a beautiful drawing, you see. And I think this is how the sort of drawings I've done come into being, that the sun is tipping up, and I'm thinking, well, what if I could make a drawing of the sun's view of the earth? Because first, I would be below the plane of the landscape early in the morning, and gradually that terrace I'm sitting on would tip forward and round and rotate. And the, the sequence would end with me going down behind. And again, the plane of the terrace would be above me. I would be looking at the underside of it. And I thought of, say, a dictionary written for the sun. The word shadow would not be in it because the sun has never seen a shadow. So that is the wish to make that drawing. And somehow at that point, and I think this is very important, the drawing from the point of view of my own perceptions of it is at its most beautiful. As I start to make the drawing, I realize maybe it's not quite such a great idea until I'm so disillusioned and the drawing is looking so shitty <laughs> and I get depressed. But it's at that moment that the new drawing that will replace the inefficient and bad old one comes to pass. And one keeps going. The new drawing rises phoenix-like out of the ashes of the old. Now, naturally, I can't really show you that drawing because I would never think, I can't let them think I do terrible drawings like this. Um, and it does matter to me, actually, that you think my work is nice. Um, <laughs> all I've done uh, to date is one that's so simple in concept, which is actually... I suppose you could say, in a way, the, um, my own view of the sun coming up and going down, a view really which would please the Holy Inquisition, would it not? The Earth-centered universe. And, uh, all right, here we go. What do I have to do here? Yeah. Do I just... Um, um, ah, yes, thank you. Uh, actually, we need to go back, don't we? That one. Can you see that all right? Um, this is the famous solar path diagram for that particular latitude, with a difference, of course. The, um, the person... You know, this, this is so an architect can work out the shadows likely to fall across a building he might be designing or she might be designing, and so on. And the person... Uh, where's the little red thing gone? Ah, there we are. Is located there. And, of course, this is the path of the sun for the days between December the 21st and June the 21st. Now, to do this, I had my faithful butler, whose name is Alzheimer, sit out on the terrace for every day of the year up until June the 21st, um, noting when the sun went in and went out. So where you have the broken line, that's where the sun is in, obscured by clouds. The continuous line, of course, is direct sunlight. But now... So you understand that, I hope, yes. And, but there's a sort of lacuna, a hiatus here in the line. Now, that could mean one of two things. It could either mean a deciduous tree that's blocking the sun, you see, therefore the line stops, which would account for its continuousness here, because, of course, the leaves fall off the tree, and so the lines are continuous. Or it could be a cloud that obscures the sun, 
uh, every day at the same time. I mean, a coincidence, yes, but why not? So in a sense, this might be seen as a solar path diagram, but it could also be seeing, seen as the drawing of a tree or a cloud, two totally different objects, but drawn in such a way that the representation of each is the same. All right. So now we go back and um, um, we have Webb, I suppose, um, drawing in such a way that he doesn't really know what he's doing and life wasn't all that confusing. I bumped into the other people of Archogram round about 1963 and that was the end of everything, I mean, forget it. And I was set on a, a career uh, of designing buildings, hopefully getting some of them built before that date. So here we are, 1958, which is so long before most of you were born, eh? Uh, not even your parents were probably born then. Um, so here we are, and a remarkable set of circumstances. This was a fourth year project at the Regent Street Polytechnic, the one John mentioned in London. And um, what happened was that after it was completed, the well-known historian and English critic Nikolaus Pevsner saw it in the end of the year exhibition and he happened to be doing a series of radio broadcasts at the time on British radio. And the subject, his subject was um, the state of modern British architecture, which he thought was terrific at the time, but I think we students had a different view. And um, he said, everything's fine, but however, there are disturbing developments in store for architecture. Um, I went to an exhibition at the Polytechnic and saw a project which um, looked like a lot of stomach sitting on a plate connected together with bits of bristle. It looked like so many bowels put together. So it immediately invented the term bowelism. Bowel, bowelism, the movement, <laughs> and, um, and uh, Rainer Bannum heard this article and put a tiny little thumbnail image of this project in the Architectural Review, which was in turn seen by the curator at the Modern in New York, who then put it in the exhibition Visionary Architecture. I mean, it was a meteoric rise to fame, and I've been sort of gently drifting down ever since, you know. Rather like rock singers, some uh, second-line rock singers who make it big at 18, and then it's over. Um, <laughs> you can tell some, even in silhouette, the figures look like... This was 19... Actually, I think it was 61, but never mind, 62 is near enough. Uh, I think I probably told you 62. I was corrected by someone. And um, it's a building that owes a lot to Frederick Keesler. I don't know if you've ever seen his work, The Endless House, which contains all these amazing forms. And <coughs> then I met up with Archigram. By the way, the building is the headquarters of a furniture association. There's um, a lecture theatre there, administrative space, blah, blah, blah. Note the tubes, a lot of tubes in this building. Uh, and so it ended up on the cover of Archigram 1 there. And Peter Cook, who was the brains behind the group, let's face it, um, he started it at all. It would never happen without Peter. Um, he wrote all these words over it, you see, skin, movement, the tubes, and so on. 
And I think one thing we did in the group, we ripped each other off mercilessly, <coughs> and he would write on it like that. And then I would, as if the ball were in my court, then do a very nice drawing of the building again with the words repeated, but this time set up beautifully. And this is actually an oil painting, not completed yet, but you can see how bowelism is written on the tube, and then, what the hell does that say? Move, move. So you've got elevation on the left upper, sectional elevation on the right, and then a plan there. These are all tubes which bifurcate and bifurcate again and lead to the individual seating and so on. And you do this, actually, I don't know, probably not, never tried it, but um, that which you could achieve so quickly in a computer, you can spend months layering very thin veneers of paint one on top of the other to get deep and rich tones. And um, you know, I can go back and spend another five years putting on extra tones and so on. So we go on. Um, next project was the Sin Palace, um, with a, a building that you could drive into, this time influenced by Louis Kahn in the Philadelphia project. Um, you would drive in as fast as you could, up ramps. Um, and then the main decks on which things happened were slung between the ramp structure and then a pedestrian circulation system over there. Right, and it was all clad in shiny aluminum panels, trying to look as much as it could like a series of airplane wings, which was another obsession at the time. All right. And made out of parts. That's the ramp. Oops. Go back one. Um, that's the ramp structure, pedestrian circulation. And made out of component parts, all pre-manufactured, lifted into place. Um, and the hope was that you could slide some of them around, at least theoretically one had the opportunity of doing that. But it made, I think, a perspective projection of the building not the thing to do. So this one, um, it seems to me out of the spirit of the building. And since there's an underlying theme in this lecture that it's all about drawing, um, I would say this is a drawing that doesn't work. Because if you have a notion of a building with parts you can move up and down, across, and so on, um, it doesn't fit to do a perspective projection of it. So this was wrong. That, by the way, in the lower part is the tension membrane roof, which is a sort of shrink wrap job over the extremities of the building. And the red is driving up the building. The blue is driving back down again. And theoretically, you would park your car and then walk through onto the pedestrian decks but the thrill would be driving fast around the ramps and having the building rotate around you. <clears throat> now, I meet up with the other members of the Archigram group, and there was a certain spirit at the time in London and Cedric Price was a big part of that. OK. There was the feeling in London that society was changing. 
There was a new spirit afoot in the land, one could say, and that there must be an architecture that reflected that changing spirit. And so the projects we did had to do with the idea, okay, so the moribund state of architecture, contrary to what Nikolaj Spesner was saying, um, was something that needed to be replaced by a new type of architecture. Did Cedric Price ever come and lecture here, do you know? No. Um, he was really the ringleader in this movement, I would say. And that uh, he told a story, I want to tell it to you now, of him going to visit a client, a married couple, and the notion was that they, during supper, would talk about the possibility of Cedric designing them a house. And so he goes there, meets up with them, and um, on the way home, they talked about the house, he wrote things down on a piece of paper, and on the way home, he realizes that what they should do is not build a new house at all, but split up. <laughs> and um, the point of the story is, you see, that maybe sometimes what's needed is not a new house or a new building, but some shift in one's life. And uh, maybe what they need is something very different from the conventional building. Do they really need a new building? It was a sort of professional suicide on the part of Cedric. And I can imagine myself that if you went to his office, there should be a plaque on the door, or shingle, I think you say in the States. Um, Cedric Price, architect, practice limited to marriage counseling and design. <laughs> Something like that, you see. And so, we saw something like this. This is actually a warm suit put out by the Frankenstein Company, which is a very good name to have. And what it has, there are tubes running through it, which presumably you plug it in to the outlet that that wants to go into. And of course, it keeps you warm on a cold day. But the notion would be that this is like a house which has been so reduced down that it's now the size of a suit. See? And um, I think it's making a connection, really, between three different items. One is the house or the room we're all sitting in. Then you reduce it down until, say, it's the metal container of your car that you're sitting inside. And then you reduce it down again until it's the size of your suit. But one could possibly conceive that one piece of hardware could perform all three functions, or maybe with add-ons or take-offs or something. And that's what Kushigal project was all about. And here you are, here's an early representation of it, with an ad for Tide in it. And there's the uh, vehicle here, the air cushion vehicle, goes along by pressing air out of its cushions, hence Kushigal. And um, we have a young woman riding it, riding on it, and what she is wearing inflates this uh, structure here. And I tried to do a drawing which somehow represents the notion of things blowing up or deflating. And then this was followed by another oil painting, like that. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, another ad for Tide. Um, and now, 
the suit she is wearing is actually like a string bag, if you imagine that, drawn tight at the knee. So imagine it's all pulled in, and over the left kneecap, there's this pad, which is the uh, neck of the string bag drawn tight. All right. The Kushigal is going to push her into the vertical position, and as it does so, this string bag starts to open out. So the phase two there, phase three, until phase four, it's almost the height of her. And the red, these strips, are actually section cuts through the landscape of the room she is in. Okay, now we have this one. Um, and I think he should be called Mike. <laughs> Do you get why? I mean, oh no, sorry, no, David. He should be David. In fact, he was, now I come to think of it, he was David, Dave, because of Michelangelo. That's why I got Michelangelo. Um, and I had a couple of friends who were Dave and Pat, so this became Dave and Pat. And here they are. They both got these pads on their knees, and when they press themselves up against each other, you see, they join, and the pad starts to open out. The problem is they find themselves eventually, you know, in phase five, inside the same suit, naked. Here we go on. Now, here's another one, um, which imagines a world in which people are changing their minds all the time, that a fixed house, such as we all live in and we all lived in then, is not the answer, <coughs> and that you could have a house for yourself which is constantly changing at whim, almost, and that you have um, a party, say. You need more space for the party, so you could rent additional space. And here it is, arriving, uh, oh yeah, arriving on this structure here. And the setup of the drawing is that you have Along the bottom and along the right-hand edge, all the parts uh, sufficient to make a house, which are then traveling along the tracks to their place in the sky, and they open out and form this additional space. And it's interesting, I think, to note a drawing I'll be showing later from Ron Heron. Um, the audience it's intended for, that drawing fits into the world of the video arcade. It doesn't look like it's been done to please architects in a fancy pants art gallery, but it's something that people would put in a video arcade and then have a wonderful time playing with it, moving the parts around. And I wish I had done that drawing, but it's Ron's idea and Ron's drawing. And it's an amazing drawing. It'll come up later. And this drawing here is really about... It was viewed as a fold-out ad in the middle of TV Guide with a huckster selling the whole thing. You see, Wayne X. Schumann. I did this first when I came to America, and was both thrilled, enthralled, and frightened by American hucksterism. And here's Wayne Eck Schumann, Fred Eck Schumann, actually, who um, um, was selling all this, you see. And I tried to get a, a drawing to represent him with the most untrustworthy-looking character I could have. So... Um, now, this is unfortunately, this is the first frame of an animation, but 
it's not possible to make it work. This is similar where the house was reduced down to being permanent units containing stuff that couldn't move like the kitchen sink and the oven. But everything else was compressed down into the size of the automobile and slid around on tracks. And this would be a phase, say, during midday of a working day. And at the end of the day, everyone would be coming home from work. And so the cars would start to accumulate and attach themselves to the permanent units. So the building would actually get bigger and bigger, you see. And so the size of the building depended on the number of people in it. So Saturday night, again, when we had the party, um, the building would be really vast then, if, especially if you had couples giving more than one party at one time. just want to go back to the previous one. Um, th you see the night sky behind. And I always thought, you know, oh, I don't know what you think about this, but when we look up at all the stars, um, we have this wonderful view and if we look at the stars, I think sometime in late July, the Andromeda galaxy is visible. You need binoculars, but there's this little fluffy piece of stuff. And it's actually another galaxy. And I'm fascinated by the fact that up until about 1920, everyone thought it was a piece of gas within our own galaxy and that it was only about um, 200,000 light years away or something. And then when they were able to measure, I think Hubble uh, found a way of measuring the recession rate of stars, and he focused his attention on this little bit of fluff. He realized that that was not 100,000 light years away or so, but in fact two and a quarter million light years away, and that it was in fact its own collection of billions of stars. And that revelation, I think is amazing that suddenly the universe was something that had increased in size by about two million fold. And it would be wonderful if the Andromeda galaxy occupied more of the night sky, I've shown it here. That's the beautiful thing about a drawing, you see. You can create a new type of universe and no one will complain. It's quite possible that were Andromeda that close, the happy couple who look so pleased with their new house, um, would be fried. <laughs> I don't know. But a drawing can lie, you see, and that's the wonderful thing about it. And that is occupying about 30% of the night sky. And I would love were that the case. All right, back to the progress. Now, it nicely actually leads into um, a project I want to show, which was based on the regatta at Henley-on-Thames in England. And it grew out of a study of perspective projection. Okay. And I hope you find this interesting. It get, get, gets very technical for a moment now. So we've somewhat left behind the world of trying to invent a new architecture for England that would represent and stand alongside the social changes happening. We get into a more private world. And I've done here on an old Windows computer using that lovely typeface OCRA. And that is a font where there's no kerning. So the next line of letters is vertically below the one you've just done which has the distinct possibility that if you were clever enough, 
you could read up and down as well as across. And that would be very difficult to do, but it'd be wonderful. Anyway, in the top one, you can see the object, and then the observer, the location of the observer, and the rays which progress from salient points on the object to the point of the observer. Now, definition of a perspective projection could be one in which there's the object, and then you have the rays which converge to a point. Right? Now, over on the left at infinity, which you can't show, obviously, is the vanishing point. Now, I wanted to investigate what happens when the observer retreats. Now, we have the definition also of orthographic projection. It could be said that orthographic projection is where the rays, or projectors as they're sometimes called, are parallel to each other, and that the, the observer, or the observing entity, is therefore a plane of indefinite distance from the object. Now, if I look this up, I'm going to read one sentence. And this is from Robin Evans's book, The Projective Cast. All right. Now, pathetically, I have to put on my other... No, I don't. Ah, never mind. I think I know it. He's saying, anyway, that... Um, um, a plan or an elevation or a section be can, can be drawn without reference to projection. It can be drawn as a series of, of gestures on a flat plane, which is then translated at a different scale onto a flat plot and built. Now that's what we do when we make a working drawing. But when you... Pull the, ob pull the observer away from the object. The lower one, of course, the object is retreating quite a long way away. There's a hypothetical situation where the observer is at infinity, and these rays which have been lessening the angle between them as we pull back end up parallel to each other. Of course, that's unattainable. But eventually, with the observer at infinity, one has the condition of orthographic projection. Therefore, the big statement would be that <coughs> an orthographic projection is a pr perspective projection viewed from infinity. So we go on, and applying all this stuff to the regatta course at Henley-on-Thames, we have the perspective projection of the regatta course, and here a plan representation of the same set of affairs. This is a plan of the regatta course. That's the perspective projection. On the left, you have old Webb attempting to do an 18th century landscape painting. Beautifully done, I have to say, no? <laughs> I mean, damn good. Um, and on the right-hand side, you have these two projections, but also the fact that now there's another observer who's located at the vanishing point looking directly at us. And what's represented here is his view. And so that if you have, for example, here a man in a rowing boat, we only see what he sees. And so 
there's a sort of white shadow behind each object. So here's the white shadow of a boat. Because he can't see behind the boat, we show it as white. He can see the water here, which is that color because um, to us, the sky, what is near is blue. When we look up, we see the blue sky. And what is far is the orange sky of the sunset. That's reversed over there because what's near to him is the sky around there. Right? There. And what's far is the orange, so that's near to us. And what was starting to happen here, it was creating a new landscape. In a way, it becomes architectural design because you're creating something new through your perceptions of the landscape. Now, the point was that if you imagine a journey to the vanishing point from here, from the location here, um, if you imagine it at a constant speed there, it'll seem to accelerate here. Because if we go at a constant speed from here to the vanishing point, we pass the various markers along the way like that and like that. But if we create that same journey on the regatta course and we are moving at a constant rate across that landscape, it'll take a long time to get from this one to that one, but less time to get from there to there and so on. And so by the end, as we approximate the vanishing point, we're going faster than the speed of light. Um, so there is the regatta course again. And it seemed to me that if you look at that drawing, um, there's the vanishing, whoops, there, damn. Um, the vanishing point right in the middle um, that it looks like that could be part of a conic form. Now, the red line was created by taking the distance of each point, each marker on the course, and projecting its distance horizontally. Now, I don't know why I did this. But it seems to work, because if you make, you mark each line, and for instance, this one is actually one unit in the perspective, and you mark one unit there, and so on, that's one and a third units, and you mark one and a third there, and you keep doing that, you get this curve. And I don't know what it means. Um, so going back to, yeah, um, so drawing that curve, um, that parabola, it looks like a parabola, um, is actually part of a cut through a, co uh, through a cone. And the question was, the reason for doing this drawing was the apex of the cone at the vanishing point, and it was. So you have the attempt to represent a cone seen in plan looking down vertically above it. And to find that indeed the section cut, this one, is actually that line along there. So, all right. Um, and this one, on the right, you have the landscape of the regatta seen from above. And it's really what you would see in this crazy form of representation. Again, as you progress, as you make a journey from there, which is the finishing line, 
up to the vanishing point which is there. Doesn't work anymore. So anyway, at the top in the middle. Um, and what you see as you progress along the course, it would appear that the if you're looking leftward, the landscape would appear distended, pulled out on the first part of the journey and gradually get compressed until at the end everything is so compressed it becomes a line. And because of that, because the wavelength of light is red when it's stretched and blue when it's compressed, one would have this transition from red to blue. Okay. Now, there is a photograph of the course. There's the finishing line. And there are the markers which form the gradation for the course. Lovely sight, hot summer day, people dressed up, and a rowing boat, one of which is just about to breast the finishing line. And the other one, the bad losers, followed by the umpire's launch there. And the name of the boat was Enchantress. Very appropriate, I think, for this project. All right, so first a little game. One of the cardinal rules of our perception of the visual world and of objects in space is that the size of an object is relative to its distance from us. If it comes towards us, it gets bigger and so on. But what if that rule were abrogated? Supposing you took Enchantress and slid her forward until she's in this position here, without changing her size. And would not the winners looking to their right be horrified to find this tiny little boat there, the little old men in it, no more than about a foot high? Um, if you continue doing that, um, which is what I should do, is extend the image over, eventually the slightest ripple on the water would, sur would um, swamp the boat. And also, the roof of the stadium has mysteriously moved back, and it is increasing in size. And the only way this could be logically done would be if um, you thought of this not as a perspective projection, but as an elevation of the regatta course because then you can slide things around. And which is why I think I had a problem with the Sin Palace drawing, which was done in perspective. Because you were trying to make a perspective of that which is essentially orthographic. So I think all the projects I've done are very much about projection, architectural projection, and how you can play with it to create absurdity. Intention, I really mean that, so. All right. And here we are. This is at the limits of space, as they call it, or maybe at the true center of space. This was a page from the Scientific American. And what it records is, whoops. What it records is a quasar, which is a galaxy probably formed right at the beginning of the universe. Because it's so far away, what we see of it is very odd and strange. Now this galaxy, that one again, is emitting a blob. Well maybe, I'm not sure, maybe that's, wait. Um, that's the galaxy, and that's the blob being emitted from it. 
and it records it over a 15-year period, the blob is moving away from the galaxy. But what they observed was that it seems to be moving away from the galaxy at about five times the speed of light, which is impossible. But the diagram there explains how that could happen because it's all about the fact that the galaxy is coming directly towards us. And so it's adding to the speed of its um, perceptual position. But I got very interested in that Temple Island project of the notion of infinity and of vanishing points and how vanishing points could almost be seen as carnivorous things because if you're traveling away from them, all the objects you pass by would seem to be get sucking, sucked into them. And I wanted to understand more about the nature of a vanishing point. And um, this seemed to be concerning just that subject. Now, this is another one. This is actually, I think, the last one of this series. Um, the town of Henley in the bottom left and the regatta course goes up, whoops, goes up like that. And this is a perspectival cone of vision with, again, someone located at the finishing line. And the cone of vision, of course, is a cone, and you see the back of it there, back elevation, and then a side view there, and this is the infinite projection of the cone into space, which led to the, didn't lead to that, um, range, oh there it is, uh, this is actually an air mass over the regatta solidified. And you're looking at the back of the cone there with the observer up in that position there. And again, he's looking at some trees and he can't obviously see behind the tree. And his line of sight is looking down this way. Uh, but so, if you imagine this as a solidified air mass, then there'll be a void in the landscape where the white shadow of the tree is. So I just love the thought of walking around in a landscape like this and seeing these shadows everywhere, these strange structures in the sky. And it becomes, in a way, a new sort of architecture in the way of sculptural form, which is generated by these weird perspective manipulations. So that's, it's a willow tree, and that's the top part of it, and those are the other parts of the same tree. And it's like almost you pour some sort of casting resin into the landscape and then remove the ground which formed a mold, formed a shuttering for the landscape, for the resin, and you have the solid sky, the, the sky solidified. All right. Yeah, I'll go back. This one here, that was um, a picture plane seen as a hemisphere because they seem to think, they being visual scientists, that a picture plane is not flat like we're taught to do it in first year, but rather hemispherical. And certainly makes sense because after all, our retinas are hemispherical. So what you're looking at there is a perspective, a plan view, looking down on the, on the picture plane, and then an elevational view 
um, representing it also. So the observer creating this picture plane is there. And it yields this image here where you take the squares of the picture plane, uh, a selection of the squares, and represent what the uh, observer is looking at. And this is a little temple uh, down the regatta course, built in about 1780. And I floodlet it uh, with a, a device which circumnavigates the drum of the temple. And it has a sort of table lamp apparatus which enables the lamp to move, which shines back on the dome of the temple and creates a shadow, you see? And done with a technique which is not to be advised. It was the old technique the Beaux-Arts students used to use, which is Chinese stick ink. You ever come across that? Amazing stuff. It comes black stick of ink, and you have a little bowl, and you rub it down in water. And then you have to filter it, you see, because there's a lot of sediment. And you do that overnight with a pipe cleaner. And what you end up with is beautiful warm gray liquid. And you put it on as a series of washes, probably 25, one on top of the other, to create those effects, you see. And I love the madness of it, you know, especially today when we, we use, uh, we can get it very quickly, aren't we? But there's something mad about it. All right. Last project, drive-in house. Um, this was about, I think, the wastage in our society that half the city is occupied with parking lots, isn't it? Could one make the car a universal object which would plug into a house, say, and act like an energizer? Because after all, it has a lot of very expensive equipment in it. And why duplicate it? Why have it in both the house and the car? And so here we are with a stripped-down Lamborghini and um, the plan view beneath it, and it drives off. And here's at least the rudimentary house. This was just about the car entering the house. How does that look? Does it look nice? Yeah, beautiful drawing. This was worked on in Photoshop. Um, on the left, we have, it's a partly underground house, by the way, and what is cut through of the landscape is all the red area. And then actually, there's a sort of um, solar path diagram skin over the house itself, which is that structure there. And I must say, it's rather ingenious how it works out, believe it or not. You drive the car in, um, up an intake access tube, and park it there, and your direction of looking, there you are sitting in the car, and you're looking vertically up. Because after all, this is only obeying one of the basic conventions of plan drawing, where you enter from the bottom and you progress vertically up the sheet. So I'm merely accommodating that in this drawing. And the drum is going to rotate. So I'm going to rotate clockwise. So it goes round like that. So this part of the skin revolves around until it aligns with that and forms a seal. <coughs> and meanwhile, the other end, of course, is rotated 
into the house. But in the second phase, of course, one must stick to the same rule. So that even though the car is rotating, the drawing must be organized in that way so that the gaze of the driver is still vertically up. Now, of course, this is swung around visually. And the same in the third one, where it's fully inside the house. And the same rule must be obeyed. So it's a case of following the rules of the game, and in doing so, ending up with total chaos, you see. In terms of understanding what the hell... What you need is a little key diagram over in the corner, which makes it quite clear and simple what's going on. All right. Um, and then, now I put on, I think this is, I don't know if it's the last one or not, but this is a, actually a drawing by, Ro, by Ron Heron, and the one I mentioned before, actually, Robo House, and how it's suitable for a video arcade. But I think entirely appropriate because he entered this house for the Pink and Shiku competition, the magazine. Don't know if he won or not, but you can imagine somehow a set of knobs below, right? And you can have the parts slide around, the parts that comprise the house slide around. And um, th this is what he was doing, really. You notice this, this was done at a time, and this ages it, you see. If you notice there, there's Pac-Man, which can eat up... Does that mean anything to you, Pac-Man? <laughs> I mean, for those who are too young and too innocent, Pac-Man was one of the first computer games, right? And you had a little thing which would gobble up everything as it passed along. It was really, quite simply, the delete button. <laughs> and... Um, he conceived of this house where somehow the actual technology of moving building parts around and the computer technology of creating or eliminating parts was seen as one and the whole part of the thing, you see? It was all seen as part of the same idea, which I thought was an amazing idea to have. Um, and you can, I love the idea of deleting things. So, I mean, I think this, is, this project is really about the impact of computer technology on architectural design. If you may remember, if I may quote a movie, no lecture would be proper without a quote from a movie. And the movie is being there with Peter Sellers. I don't know. Born, you were born after, I think it was in the 80s or something like that. Being there is about a young man, played by Peter Sellers, who grows up in a very sheltered environment. He never goes outside the garden of the house he lives in. And his experience of the outside world is totally from television, what he sees on television. That's how he reads and understands the world. And finally, the old lady who's been looking after him and seeing to the house and so on, she dies. And so the house is sold from under him and he's cast out. He's kicked out of the house. He has to leave the garden. And all he's left with is his clicker. And the house is in a very bad neighborhood of the city. And he sees thugs coming towards him. And he's quickly trying to change the channel. He doesn't like the look of this, you see. And he believes just by changing the channel, he can create a nicer world. And I think that's beautiful, too. But that's the nature of what this project is about. Oh, that is it. What we're going to end with, though, is some slides quickly run by of the rest of the group's work. 
And uh, what do I have to do for that? I forget. I say, oui, wake him up, yes, okay. Um, I might be tempted to say one or two brief things about it, but... Um, what? Oh, but do I need to do something? What do I Yeah, that's the mic, isn't it? And that's actually my own. That's the um, uh, Prismacolor drawing of the site of the Henley Regatta. What is it? I stop. But just one more thing about this. It took three months to do this. And then at the top, the white was done in a mad moment with a spray can. It could have been a disaster for the whole. Anyway, okay, next. Do I do next? Yes. Okay, next. All right. <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> Peter Cook, Plug In City, early drawing. Uh, Peter Cook again. Uh, part of the Monte Carlo competition. Hole in the ground. Next. Dennis Crompton, Computer City. I just want to say one thing about this drawing. Um, this is about really, there's no real architecture in this drawing to talk of at all, unless you count the space frame roof up in the top left. It's much more about the scene that this architecture would make possible. I think it's a very interesting drawing because if you look at the drawing surface, at least 80% of it is taken up with stuck-on photographs culled from magazines. Sort of interesting, that. You have to realize that at the time this was done, it was considered um, not OK at all to have figures in architectural drawings. And even t if you did have to have one for scale, it should be tiny and not noticeable at all. So, I mean, this drawing is quite a break away from that notion. Next. Um, I like that this is by Peter, and this is what would happen to a house as the years rolled by and changes happened, new technologies were brought in. And in the end, we have 1985, that far off future date, and no one really knows what's going to happen then. Okay. Um, that's Temple Island again. The imprint of a figure on a mattress when they've got up. And the next one is the same. Uh, Linda Ronstadt, taken from a record album. And it's the, this, this was the time there was a submarine as a way of getting down the river. Pencil rendering. And she is lying her head on the pillow inside the submarine, leaving an impression, looking through those orange holes at the landscape ahead under the water. And there's a kinship with the Holy Shroud of Turin, where the impression of Christ was um, conveyed onto the surface of the winding cloth. All right, next. All right, a, a drive-in uh, model of plug-in city and various structures and so electric car, electric runabout in the foreground. Amazing to think that then a little electric runabout that you could go to the supermarket with was conceived of a car with tiny wheels and 10 foot long. What I see now is people driving their automotive leviathans the Ram 2500s to the supermarket. Tiny little figure 
gets out of this two-ton lump of metal. I'm appalled. Next. Look at the airbrush. Yes, fantastic drawing of the submarine. <laughs> um, from the side, you see. And another version of it. Resurgam, I will rise again. The first submarine was also named that. And the first submarine was very good at submerging, but it wasn't so good at rising again. <laughs> Next. Yeah, there's another light study of photons of light. Trying to explain to myself, actually, um, why a lamppost, if he were traveling towards it in a car at half the speed of light, would appear to bend backwards. It works. Too late to go into it, but let's keep going. Yeah, there's a cone of vision again with the picture plane at the back of the image. Next. Oh, God, that again, yeah. Next. <laughs> um, another cone of vision. Um, looking down from the top on it, with the observer at the lower apex, and then rotating sections on the right. Next. Yeah, the, oh, dear. Well, that's... Something we've lost completely with PowerPoint, isn't it? The upside-down slide image. I put that specially in upside-down so you would have a sweet little act of memory and think remembering old-fashioned slideshows. But it doesn't matter. It works the same way. This, was, I, this is the last one. And I'll just mention that briefly. In the Sunday Times color magazine about five years, no, 15 years ago, there was a photograph of Mrs. Brooke Astor in a limo. And the photograph seems to be taken through the rear view mirror. And it was so interesting. Why was a guy on the left of the photograph looking rather suspiciously across the car? And uh, so I did this drawing trying to explain to myself what was going on in the... Um, there's the actual, this is a plan view of the car, obviously, the driving mirror. And it's evident that the cameraman was uh, there. But of course, I don't show the cameraman because he didn't photograph himself. And so there's rays bouncing off the driving mirror coming from Mrs. Astor, who's there looking a bit goggle-eyed. <laughs> and it works because what was out of focus in the image fitted the nature of the projection. So the front of the car, you can't see this here, was actually out of focus. And the stuff around here was very much out of focus. So what that says upside down is blur scale. Oh, that was absolutely in focus there, because obviously he's focusing on Mrs. Astor's face. And everything in both directions is increasing in blur value as you progress away. See? So, that's it. Thank you very much.